Thank you very much. It's a great honor, actually, to deliver the lecture, uh, this year's uh, Edward McFarland lecture. Uh, and I would love to hear the story of how this uh, was established, actually, in the first place as well, if it is possible after my speech, uh, because this is actually a dedication um, between a patient and a doctor and the trust relation, which I will try to mention in my speech as well through my own personal story. Um, how I am relate related to orthopedics, I'm a very good uh, orthopedics patient, very experienced as well. So that is how I'm related to this uh, crowd. And I'm quite um, in awe of what you're doing, really. Um, so of course, speaking to um, some of the most distinguished and future promising doc doctors here, some of the slaves that I can see the faces of. <laughs> in the orthopedic field is a veteran orthopedic surgery patient is really unnerving when you need uh, the most um, it, it, when you need help the most sometimes I believe God may not be there but doctors nurses medical staff is always there uh, I know it's proven in my life um, so often believing that they tend to be closer to people than God makes it even more difficult for me uh, to be in your presence today well, I've spent my life drawing attention to the stories of other people, life stories of other people. So it's also quite difficult to talk about my own story um, and being the center of attention. But I will try. I will try. I must admit that I'm a famous patient. Sometimes I'm asked why I'm famous. And my answer always feels strange to me. And I'm sure it would feel strange to you as well. Because I had an accident. Doesn't that sound absurd? Such stories always have multiple realities, of course, and only doctors truly understand it all. They witness more of a patient's journey than the family does, in fact. My journey began, this journey of mine, began in May 1996, when I was a 19-year-old art student. I was at the Zurich train station early in the morning, sending my friend Miralowski, a cancer patient, from Zurich to Geneva for uh, Geneva for chemotherapy session. I held him in my arms as I helped him board the train, and I was trying to get him, get him on board and give him his ticket, as I realized that the train started moving with its doors open. One of us was definitely going to fall. I remember pushing him forward into the train and then falling myself. Some people get hit by cars or fall on rail tracks and then get up and move on. That was not how my fall turned out. My life changed forever. There was a lasting, very loud noise while the train and its many wagons left the station. Hi. <laughs> I managed to save my head with only um, some injury. My left arm was lying a bit further away, separated from me, and my left leg was torn apart. I had been at odds with my left side, by the way, since my childhood. Even though I try to hide it, my left ear is protruded, and here I will share it with you. <laughs> my mother would stick, that mother of mine would stick my ear to my head with duct tape for months after I was born. <laughs> Uh, when I was a baby, but they never, ever even doubt. As a child, I remember being regularly mocked for my left ear sticking out. No surprise, perhaps that the accident would target my left side, but I thought of. I remained conscious during the accident. As I lay on the ground, I interacted with the most handsome doctor in the world, can, can my arm be saved, I asked him, I remember. He said, it's too late. And then I said, then please save the rest of me. He said, I promise you. <laughs> I would later discover that my doctor believed that this sentence um, at, the, at the immediate moment of the accident, right after the accident, was the first sign of my will to live, and that he described it as magical. Normally, I'm not so blunt, but I know that doctors face these events very daily basis, so I didn't feel constrained by sensitivities in this, in this speech. Catastrophes make our subconscious more transparent. 
it may be un unscientific of me, but I have always felt that our instincts are also useful in sensing what is about to happen to us. A few days before the accident, I felt extremely uneasy, like an animal, sensing an earthquake before it happens, almost. I even wrote in my diary as a 19-year-old that I felt there would be a dramatic change that I would carry for the rest of my life. Every now and then, I still look at my diary to read that sentence and wonder how a passionate and adventurous young girl could have written such a thing. Perhaps our instincts to sense disasters are as strong as those of horses or dolphins, but we are unable or unwilling to trust them. Similarly, my mother, who at the time of my accident was in Istanbul, later told me that at 10 a.m. that day, she felt a sharp pain in her nose, sizzling pain. In Switzerland, it would have been 9 a.m., the time of my accident. As you can guess, the accident was followed by a lengthy hospital stay, an odyssey. Physicians deemed me an interesting patient. I think this was because of how I met my family for the first time after the accident. You should know that my mother and I have a slight difference in size. Thankfully, she could not wear my clothes. But I could not save my shoes from her because our shoe sizes are the same. You may be asking yourself, what is it related to? Well, she made it to Zurich 24 hours after my accident and insisted that she be let into the intensive care. My psychiatrist at the time, who regarded me as a brave patient, was worried that any emotional weaknesses that my family displayed could weaken my resistance. Clearly, she did not know my family. Let me tell you a story here to explain my family. Years after my accident in 2003, when I was working for the United Nations Refugee Agency, I discovered that I had not been assigned for a humanitarian operation in Iraq, in Baghdad. I hurried to my boss's office and volunteered for the Iraq assignment. He said, you already have the weight of your prosthetics, he replied to me. How will you add another 30 kilos of protective helmet and waistcoat on top of that? I, could, I said, I could not explain it to my mother if I did not get the work in the Iraqi humanitarian operation. He gave me a surprised and merciful look. And he said, for the first time in my life, I've heard of a mother who wants her kid to work in a war area. I think you should leave your family immediately, Shafak. <laughs> so yes, and getting back to the hospital moment, where we get acquainted again with my mother. I remember seeing their blurry silhouettes, my family's silhouettes, between my giant blue bandages as they walked into my room. My mother was wearing my favorite red shoes. I never asked her, but to this day, I think she chose them on purpose. Her first sentence did not surprise me, but shocked my doctors, judging by their facial expressions at the time. She said, you're having all these operations. You could also have your left ear fixed in the midst of all these operations. <laughs> Try to get an aesthetic operation too, she said. I smiled. <laughs> looking at her shoes, which of course were mine. And I said, and I see that you didn't lose any time, mom, seizing the opportunity to steal my shoes. This was our first interaction. My eight-year-old brother at, uh, at the same time continued, thank God you had an accident, sister. My teacher is treating me really well these days, even if I don't do my schoolwork. <laughs> At that time, I was somewhere between drowning and making it to the surface. My family's opportunism and white lies really helped me heal, start the first steps of, of coming to the surface, actually, and swept aside my feeling of helplessness. My stay at the hospital was filled with never-ending operations and fun memories. I think Dr. Kaiser, my top, um, my head orthopedic surgeon, was probably the most pleased person when I was discharged. 
He took care of me for the longest period of time and did so with great patience. On one occasion, he needed tissue from my head to graft on my leg, whatever was left of it. For this, I had to shave my head. I refused to do it when he broke the news to me for the next morning's operation. Uh, I refused to do it unless he did so as well. Without any hesitancy, I remember he had his hair shaved. I remember this with eternal gratitude, always, even as I hope that he, will, he never has to en encounter a patient like me again. When the dust settles after a disaster, it's easy to find yourself in an inescapably bad place. It is. My doctors, nurses, all the medical personnel taught me how not to fall into that trap of feeling sorry for myself. They also rewarded me for my confidence by taking me to other patients as a model. It really helped me too. The ability to redefine life the idea that my success could impact the lives of others was and still remains an invaluable lesson. I had a lot to do. It would not be a sprint anymore, but a long marathon that would require patience and fortitude to catch up with, my, um, with, with the other people, with my peers in my generation. It began with figuring out the things that I could not do. For example, I would never be able to jump again, I thought. It was also very difficult to speak with only one arm. As with all Mediterranean people, I used my hands as an extension of my mouth. I would be forced to rely more on words now. Uh, I soon found that I still had car enough courage to make fun of myself as well. Humor, I found, can heal in every shape sometimes better than any drug, drugs found so far. It is a tremendous value for me. I remember a toy cow given to me as a gift in the Swiss hospital, which made us laugh for days. The cow would moo when I pressed a button on its stomach and acted as an alarm when nurses came with their needles so I could run away. Months later, I was at a prosthetic clinic in Münster, Germany. While there, my mother was being presented with the award for courage in journalism in New York. The skeleton of my prosthetic leg had just been completed in the rehabilitation center, and my arm was not there at all. I was not allowed to leave, but I secretly left one evening and boarded a plane. While the doctors were looking for me, I was flying to New York. That evening, there would be a high-profile guest such as Christiana Mampur, Peter Arnett, Peter Jennings, and the Clintons. They were surprised when they saw me with bandages instead of an arm and the skeleton of a leg. They assumed I was the victim of a bombing due to my mother's receipt of numerous death threats for covering issues such as mafia state relations or Islamist assassinations. They seemed unconvinced and almost disappointed when I told them it was the result of a train accident in one of the safest countries in the world, Switzerland. After 15 years, I admit that I'm not even halfway back. Today, I work with a Russian therapist to subconsciously open and free up my left hand, which was locked in a fist when I lost it in the accident. It caused me a lot of pain, as I still recall this subconsciously. You know it all, the phantom pain. Even though I have a long way to go, we managed actually to unmake the fist I carried with me since the accident. It was a way of combating the phantom syndrome that we discovered ourselves. So each step, each time, each day brings me more solutions. Undoubtedly, there is more than just a physical wreck and toll of an accident. Accidents and disasters can sometimes remove barriers between people, but also place new ones. The most challenging part, I guess, was always the unspoken prejudices against disabled people. As other disabled individuals frequently experience, 
the place society deemed suitable for me and the place I thought I belonged to constantly clashed. My new enemy was actually the entrenched attitudes in society that refused to give me a place. The public at large reached out to me with pity, with mercy. I rejected it outright because it always has a threatening hidden side. Pity and mercy lower one's place in society. The majority wanted me to be invisible for their own peace of mind. I do not know who these people are, but I knew I had to win this war without being acquainted with them. I became even more visible by challenging their arrogant attitudes that wished me to disappear. I guess my strange accidental fame originated in this struggle. I must confess I learned how to differentiate between what was important and unimportant in my life through this accident. The accident did not change my values, only revised my dreams. Some people use events as an excuse not to continue with their lives. The most appropriate course of action for me would be never leaving the house, would have been. But I did leave the house. I chose not to be hidden away. My first moments after leaving the hospital were not easy, of course, you would all know that. It felt like being released after serving a long prison sentence, only to be dropped off, dropped off on an unfamiliar, abandoned street, back to life. The existence of a strict caste system created for families with disabled people became apparent to me. In 1996, the bodies of affluent members of society had to be perfect in my country. But a fault of the body or brain cannot be punished with isolation. High-level personal attacks served as an intimidation ploy to have me disappeared from the public eye. Well-known columnists wrote articles saying that I was playing games. My optimism was dishonest and had other motivations. When I questioned them and asked, even if it was feigned optimism, what was exactly wrong with it? I received no replies to it. I chose to fight on and continue to be out there. Of course, I wish I never had an accident. But as it was not possible to go back, we must succeed in being able to move forward. The story can be easily told, our stories can be easily told, easily written, but never easily endured. In November 1996, the press reported me, my appearance in a restaurant, as a first-time public appearance of a disabled person eating at a restaurant in Istanbul. I had no idea about accessibility, but my instincts convinced me that I had a place at the restaurant as much as anyone and everyone else. The first ramp at Kashibeya's restaurant, the first elevator at Bilgi University, where I continued my education, the many ramps and lifts at my later employer, United Nations Human Rights Offices buildings in Geneva and elsewhere, are all remi reminders of my times there. I know these are the tra traces that I share with many other disabled persons who struggle for each change every day. Leaving architectural trails without being an architect feels rather unique. <laughs> However, I had more barriers than just the crude architecture drowned in concrete. As far as people on the streets or public sector workers were concerned, Begging on the side of the street was the only acceptable public space for disabled people. As someone who went outside without being intimidated by her disability, this meant I was crossing a line. Years later, those same people who could not bear the thought of a disabled female making public appearances voted me in for the office. Today, I have a reputation for being out on the streets all the time, and it suits me well. 
I love connecting with people and maintaining my public visibility for able and disabled persons alike. Even though we still have not attained the right to accessibility, we did gain the right to visibility. Partially defeating a centuries-old prejudice was a happy start for a Middle Eastern society. I still am subject to attacks by bigots, but I know how to defeat them now. Recently, I exposed a member of ruling party's executive committee who sent me a tweet which read, God has taken one of your legs and you still haven't woken up from the sleep of blasphemy. What an obstinacy, he was saying. He was removed from office after a public protest. It was just one little step towards hopefully a bigger cultural transformation. This is the kind of hate speech stemming from the deep culture that millions of disabled people in my country face on a daily basis. I often observe and take great pleasure in knowing that my high visibility and transparency became a source of courage for others who hid away. The often ignored silent majority are slowly stepping out into the daylight. When I look back, I believe that this is the struggle that I can take most pride in. I come from a family that has given a great deal of thought to how the majority of people face and resist difficulties that they encounter throughout their lives. This prompted me to take an interest in the struggles of others. <coughs> One of my most difficult and meaningful memories occurred during my visit and work with the Afghani refugee children. We stayed in a settlement without electricity. During my visit, my leg, which is charged, suddenly stopped functioning. There was no electricity. The children, though, found parts from old Soviet radios and managed to make a small wind turbine to construct a charger. We charged my leg with great ceremony and laughed a lot in the process. But of course, there is no need to look at this with rose-tinted glasses. Of course, I wish I had never had an accident. But as it is not possible to go back, moving forward is the only way, as I said. And this has been through the stories of others. So here, I would like to also share with you the story of Stare. Her story has been great company for me to keep orienting my compass in the right direction and reminding me of the importance of fighting for rights and freedoms for others. I had just started on my new humanitarian mission in Iran when I was called by the guard of our Tehran-based office to meet with Afghan refugees. When I went downstairs to the medical unit, I saw a young woman looking at me, terrified, her eyes filled with pain. In her tradition, her male relatives spoke for her. This is how I met Sitare, that means star in Urdu. By then, I did not know that she would be a turning point in my life. Sitare had a medical problem related to her internal organs, and they wanted a female doctor to examine her. I would meet with her quite frequently as, I, as we arranged for her long treatment process. In time, she began to talk with me slowly. Her story came out in bits and pieces. She was born without limbs and was married off to an elderly man as his third wife when she was only 13 years old. Yet, Sitare looked the same age as me. She seemingly had grown decades older by being a child bride, a consequence of the hard geography that she was born into. Horribly, she was locked up in a dark room for many years and used only as a sex object. She couldn't run away from that room because she didn't have access to prosthetics. In her circumstances, in that culture, this was somehow deemed acceptable. Her disability meant she did not have any value as a human being. Her feelings counted for nothing, nor did her despair. Despite it all, she had survived, though, 
and escape from conflicts in her hometown with her family. She became a refugee in Iran, resisted the destiny imposed on her, and believed in the existence of another more hopeful future. That is why I'm sharing it with you. It's a hope story, actually, not to set any further this morning. <laughs> her silence and forbearance were the keys to her survival. I became attached to her with admiration. We overcame many things together. Today, Sitare is back in her homeland where peace, social freedoms, and human rights are seemingly a fragile possibility. She tells other girls in Afghanistan about the possibility of another life, though, that they can hope for more than life as a child bride. Sitare's journey is one of my most important inspirations. Wherever I go, I search for Sitare's. Stories like hers, but not always easy to find amidst the dust of extraordinary human-made disasters that cover the face of the earth today. I believe, though, elevating one person, which is what you do on a daily basis, is more precious than targeting unreachable mountaintops. Well, I shall continue to contribute to humanity's big adventure with my small steps and small experiences. My mission is not over. Back in my homeland, Turkey, a 13-year-old girl was raped by approximately 24 to 26 men. Just recently, the higher court ruled that the girl willfully gave her consent and reduced, therefore, the sentence on these grounds. It is time to fight against this decision now for me. In short, life sometimes is very difficult. But looking inwards and making the problem bigger only leads to dead ends, in my opinion. When we shut our doors to the problems of others, I believe we also miss vital opportunities to find our own solutions. Tolstoy wrote that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Undoubtedly, he's right. In the context of human progress, the driving force has often been the focus on those that are sorry. The focus has often been on those that are unhappy to make the progress. When one chooses to involve oneself in common human struggles, when one chooses to be a remedy for the problems of others, then one's own problems become really less important. That's what I found out, in short. I believe this is also the best method of self-healing. I guess those who know this best are doctors and the medicine family who wakes up very early and somehow has their meetings at 6 a.m. Sometimes it's inevitable to just focus on oneself. Occasionally, of course, I find myself thinking about my life before the accident. I admit that I really do miss jumping around, and I do miss my clumsy left arm. But I am now much stronger than those who never fell in their lives, because I know how to stand up again. Falling is not a very bad thing, after all because you learn, as I said, how to stand up again. Thank you very much for your patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs>